thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with with you, and thank you for for, for the invitation. Thank you to the European Parliament. Uh, as, as we were discussing this morning, um, I think the, the big story in, in this election is whether it will be different, uh, and, and why um, will it be so. Uh, I slightly disagree with, with, with the idea that it, that it would be different just because uh, there will be a possibility of influencing uh, the choice of the next president of the European Commission. I think the election will be different and the big questions and the big stories uh, behind these elections are elsewhere. Uh, first, I think the big question is what is the impact of the crisis? As, as, as said, uh, we uh, we know that turnout is a historical problem for the, for, for the European Parliament and on EU elections, but I think this time is different in terms of how bad uh, European institutions image, uh, and, and in general, all political institutions across Europe, with, uh, with, uh, with an important difference is that national political institutions in the south are doing much worse than national political institutions in the north. In the north. So uh, when you look at, um, at, at polls, at your barometer polls, you very clearly see the damage which the crisis uh, has done to, uh, to the image of Europe, to trust in European institutions, and also, as I said, to trust in, in national institutions. Uh, one, this is a very standard one um, where you see how at the beginning of the crisis, trust uh, positive images uh, about the EU were at 52%. Now there are 30 percent. It's almost, uh, it's almost, you know, 30, 29. It's very close. So if you do a, a sort of approval rate for the for the EU, it's almost zero. So it's perfectly public opinion is almost perfectly divided on how much they uh, on the on the views of, of the EU. The same on on trust uh, being read uh, lack of trust uh, in in the EU. You you really see the impact of of the crisis uh, when you go for individual countries, for example, you know, we, we used to think that Britain was eurosceptic because uh, the, the, it had uh, something like 20% uh, approval rate of the, of the EU. No? Now, there are countries like Spain, for example, which have gone from 42 to 58, Cyprus from 32 to 70. So even, and, and as, as said here, this doesn't really make a difference between creditors and debtors. It's more pronounced of course, in, in debtor countries. But uh, this is a very damaging situation. This is not a zero-sum game that somebody's happy because somebody's unhappy or the other way around. You know, Southerners are not unhappy and therefore somewhere else is happy somewhere else. Uh, everybody is quite unhappy uh, with, with the EU uh, and this uh, throughout, throughout these years in 2007, 2013. I think it's remarkable to, to, to look at, this, at these figures. So the story is how will this translate into what? And, and this is as, 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 as Simon uh, has, has explained and, and also with the, with the explanations about the electoral system, what will be the impact of this? Uh, there, are, there is a difference, as, as I say, between the north and the south right, uh, with national political institutions. But I think this is not relevant to the discussion. Maybe we can discuss this in, in, in the debate. But generally, uh, uh, national, all political institutions are doing that. I'm not really sure that the argument, I think, is too complacent sometimes when people here in Brussels, they say, well, we're doing as bad as national institutions. You know, the European Parliament is still a bit more prestigious than national governments. Well. Uh, the same with turnout in the U.S. Uh, the fact that Americans do not massively vote for Congress does not question the legitimacy of Congress. Whereas uh, here in Brussels, uh, I'm sure, and we can discuss that, there is a floor to turnout after which uh, politicians may wonder whether it is useful to have an European Parliament which is directly elected, and they may go, out, they may go back to 1979 of having an assembly of national parliamentarians. But there must be, there is a floor to that, whereas I don't think there is a floor to that in the U.S. system or in any of our national parliaments, right? Uh, so so there's a big of a different story. Uh, so there are very serious cracks in European unity, in trust on, in European institutions, very important divides between north and south, which are not only economic but are political, social, and so on, which... Which, which are very relevant. Then the 
question will then do, we, you know, the, the, the second question is, will Eurosceptics be able to capitalize on that? You know, 390 million people are called to the polls uh, in May. Uh, with these figures, this means that 183 million people do not trust in the European Parliament and they are asked to either vote or stay at home and then, of course, decide who to vote for. I am, I'm going to be a bit provocative here by saying that I think your skeptics are doing extremely good because they're better. They have probably understood better the nature of EU politics than pro-European forces. They play very well this game and they are outperforming uh, uh, pro-European forces. So pro-European forces should get their act together. Why? Let's, let's try to substantiate this argument. I think they, uh, European institutions tend to communicate a lot, but your skeptics tend to listen better. Uh, the narrative which your skeptics use is very simple and very understandable, is the EU is the problem, the nation state is the solution. You may, of course, disagree with this, but this is a very clear vision. Pro-European forces do not have the reverse vision that the nation state is the problem and Europe is the solution. Uh, nation, national and EU member governments will never say that the nation state is a problem and therefore is the solution. In fact, as we see, they tend to very often blame Europe for, th for things which happen at home. So they tend to also give the idea that the European uh, level is the problem. Eurosceptics, they fail to coordinate in Europe. We know in the votes in the European Parliament that they don't vote even for things they should vote for, like strengthening Frontex. You know? They don't want Europe to be stronger even when it is about uh, you know, repressing immigrants. They want to do that at home. So they don't work well together. The last time they had they did this attempt to coordinate uh, with the Romanians felt out because they felt insulted by the French. Uh, so far-right parties do not coordinate well at Europe, but they don't really care about this. I think they coordinate very well nationally. There is where they pick the themes uh, which, which work very well. And there is where pro-European forces do not coordinate very well. And you can see this in any of your member states. I can see it in Spain. Uh, Spanish socialists and Spanish Germans don't, do not coordinate well. They have not reached an agreement on very basic things related which, which they care for. So that's, that's one point. I think um, whereas the second point is that whereas uh, European institutions spend a lot of time and money in trying to separate national politics and EU politics, we're not responsible for that. We're not uh, uh, responsible for these or all the things. Eurosceptics are very effective and bl at blending everything and putting everything together and putting all the blame on, on, on the EU. And then, of course, I think they speak very well to the basic emotions uh, and, and, and interests, which sometimes EU policies neglect and also national uh, politics uh, neglect. People care about jobs, they care about security, they care about identity, and your skeptics are very well at playing at, at those things. People do not really care about the single supervisory mechanisms and, 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 and things like that. Uh, even inflation is something which only uh, in, in some countries in very particular circumstances is, is, is cared about. Um, so this is why I think they, they will do well and I think uh, they are outperforming. Um, and they are already winning, as, as you say. You know, they, they, they are managing to turn national politics in, into directions which are consistent with their interests. This is what they, in fact, they care about. They want to have an impact in Brussels by having the impact on those who think are in charge. Which, is, which are national governments. Um, and this has to do, which leads me to the point of the silver ballot of the crisis, which is the selection of the president of the commission. Simon and I have been discussing this time and again. I think uh, the impact will be felt at home. Eurosceptics, they work at home. They want to reduce the appetite for more Europe at home. So governments who are actually in charge at the European Council, this sort of uh, mm, hidden federal government, especially in, during the crisis that we have out there, uh, reduces uh, the appetite for Europe and delivers less Europe. I think they're working very effectively on the lines of the Tea Party. They just need to be there in order to condition others not to do things. They don't necessarily need others to do a lot of things. They just need to, 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 to put a very high penalty on parties defending free circulation of, of, of labor or all the things. So they really need not to capture institutions. And, and in a sense, they are already uh, victorious when, when they manage just to be there and to scare national politicians to death uh, when, when they want to do these moves. So um, 
to the extent to which, and you know, I, 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 we, we have this discussion on, on, on the silver bullet. Some people say that the silver bullet is the typical trick which represents what is all wrong about what Europe has been doing, you know, in the sense that a marginal improvement in an institution will change the game. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that radical. I think this is a marginal uh, uh, improvement. Maybe under different conditions it would have a major effect, but probably this is not enough under these conditions because, because of the euro crisis, we know that the next president of the Commission, he would not be the president of the government. He not, he's not going to be the president of the European government. The Union is moving towards a union of rules, and the president of the Commission will have to work within those rules. He's not Obama. He cannot pull a TARP program out of the head. He cannot, I mean, we don't have that political system which will give a president of the Commission a government and, and, uh, to act and so on. So, uh, but let's have this discussion. My, the risk, as, as I think the polls and the numbers which, which, which Simon put on the table, is that the Parliament and the European institutions, they adopt the reflect that we've seen in national politics to become even more technocratic, to behave even more as a cartel of elites. Pro-European forces within, with, with these polls, they, the main two parties would have slightly under 60% of the votes in the European Parliament. So they will have to work together so if you want, like in all our member states, if you call the people to vote on a left-right dimension consistently, as they've done in 2004 and 2009, Spain is a very good case, very good case in, in point, campaigns fought on national left, on a, on a, on a light, uh, right and left dimension, and then the socialists voting for Barroso. Yeah, because, uh, if you do this for a third time, you really convince people there is a left-right dimension of this election, and then you have a consensus government with the liberals in between and then again behaving as a cartel of elites, you will further uh, 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 excite prob probably uh, Eurosceptics. Uh, so I think this is a very important risk. And, and what happens for the, for the next five years will be crucial because you see more and more voices in many different national parliaments that this parliament, the European parliament, is not legitimate enough to do the things that have to be done in terms of completing monetary union with a banking union, a fiscal union, and even uh, an economic government. So, so there is a looming threat that this next parliament will spend a lot of time defending itself from those who want to renationalize it in different, in different forms and in different uh, uh, variations. But I think we can discuss that uh, in, in afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. A lot of... Uh...